posting. It says it's broadcast video is live. Yay. So um, Blair is, there's her hands, but Blair is in Jerusalem. <laughs> she made it safely. We are so Yay. excited. I Yay. did it. You I got it. on the plane. <laughs> I ha I have to know. I guess we'll we'll answer this question at the end of the next hour. But uh, whether or not <laughs> you're going to enjoy doing this every <laughs> every week that, at six that in the remains morning. to be seen. One thing that um, <laughs> is funny is that here the weekend is um, Friday Saturday, um, and so. Thursday night, the night before I would wake up early to do this, is when everyone goes out. Aha! <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, so you're a little, maybe a little bit more worse to wear in these mornings mm. than you mm -hmm. would be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, especially since I'm hanging out with all these young whippersnappers, everyone in this group is like, uh, no. <laughs> well, between like probably 20 and 23 most of them and I know that's not a huge difference from my age but they're either in college or right out of college it's a very different mentality from where I'm at right now and I'm like you guys still want to go out some more <laughs> <laughs> I can't. can I go home yeah well you know you can always pull the old card and be like yes, you I know will. I need to go home and drink mm. tea and knit something um, I was called old last night by a man on the street, so... Are you kidding? <laughs> no. It was a... Um, it was a, a, a guy from New York who is studying here, and he was 18. He, was, he just started college, and he asked me how old I was. He said, damn, you're really old. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, 18-year-olds. Yeah. Get some perspective. Just Everyone else is late. saying, where's just the club? Late. And I said, can we just sit down and I'll drink a beer? <laughs> <laughs> Get into the club. Yeah. Uh, so. boots, boots, cats, boots, cats, boots, <laughs> cats. That's right. Boots and cats and boots and cats. Oh, well, it's, I am so excited to see you here. It's just lovely yeah. to see your face and to be able to talk with you. I'm like, yeah! Yay. Oh, the drinking okay. age in Israel is 18, Del Poco. That's why 18-year-olds, when they come here, they can go a little crazy. Just a little bit. A little bit. Just a little bit. I imagine. I was going to scroll down. Oh, yes. Share this thing with everybody. <laughs> Twit refugee. That's funny. Yeah, I'll just go out. I'll just stay up. Yeah, that's good. Well, since, you know, Friday is my Saturday, probably a lot of days I could just, I might just go back to sleep when this is over, so we'll see. <laughs> go right back to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Do we get to hear about your zoo? Have you started the zoo yet? No, I don't actually start in, working in the zoo until October, um, because right oh, now wow. I'm learning Hebrew. Oh, right. Yeah. So I started learning Hebrew two days ago. So this is my third day. We're going to finish learning the alphabet today. <laughs> nice. <Yeah. laughs> Do you know the alphabet already? No. I no, don't. you're still learning. I don't know what order it goes in or anything. All right. <laughs> Get to work, lady. <laughs> yes. I'm trying. What I, what I need to do, I got my whole learn Russian Rosetta, Rosetta Stone thing going, so I still have to learn the Russian alphabet. That's where I need to start. Mm -hmm. So I can actually yeah. read the Russian words. That's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do have a song for the alphabet. I haven't learned it yet. Um, and yes, the animals do speak Hebrew here. If you think about it, <laughs> the animals speak whatever language they live in because... <laughs> When they're trained to, you know, sit, when you say sit, <laughs> if you're German, you say whatever sit is in German. I don't know what it is. And if you're in France, you would tell the dog assier. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so they do speak the language. I know people keep making that joke to me. The animals speak Hebrew, right? And I'm like, well, actually, yes. <laughs> um, I didn't have a bat mitzvah, twit refugee. That's why I did not learn Hebrew. But most people, when they learn that, they learn until they're 13 and then they don't touch it again. So I have quite a few people in my class that did that but had to start over still. 
but they had a little bit of a leg up on me. I just knew the Hebrew letters that are on a dreidel at um, Hanukkah. That's all I knew, those four letters. <laughs> I'm so excited. I think I have recording that's actually going to work today. Maybe. Mm. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. We'll see. I'm recording in a couple of places, and hopefully that'll... Oh, good. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's almost 8 o'clock, and yes. uh, we were supposed to start a half an hour ago. A few technical difficulties. Uh, yes. Blair's just getting her feet... I guess uh, not your feet on the ground in Israel, so you're getting things... Yeah. Getting things organized, making sure things will work, and figuring out the flow mm. for stuff. Yes, like, I just recently it. figured out where I live, like how to get home. <laughs> that's, that's important. Yes, it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's, make sure you can get home from mm -hmm. the bars, and then, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we can move forward, and then you can yes. use the show. Yeah, that's step one. <laughs> step one, learn where you live. Step two, maybe remember your name. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, Justin's not going to be here tonight. I don't know what's going on with him. I think it has something to do with work. There have been very cryptic messages via text uh, the last few hours, so I don't know what's going on. Um, uh, I don't know. I'm going to try and figure out what's happening and see if we need to work something out. I don't know what's going on here. I don't know what's happening. I'm here. You are here, though. Mm -hmm. So, And there's a lot of science, so I think we should just do a show. We can talk. I think we can film, fill the next hour. So, I made up a disclaimer, and um, I'm ready to roll. If you are, yeah, I'm just whoa, <laughs> whoa. About last night, and it's six. Just sit quietly. No, sit it's quiet. I, I was trying to get into the page to edit the notes, and the internet's freaking out on me. Oh, I got it. Mm. <laughs> the internet is like, I'm freaking out, man. I'm in Israel. <laughs> I'm freaking out. It took me two days to get my mail application working. <laughs> and now it stopped working again. All right, anyway, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> she says she's ready. So this week in science will start in three, two. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer! When in the course of human events it becomes necessary to intervene with the path of humanity, we hold these truths to be pretty relevant. Science is a process, not a belief. Science can infuse human decisions with reason and logic. Learning the scientific method leads to independent thought. Let us be your gateway to thought and independence. Here on This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. Good morning, Blair. <laughs> Thank you. Good night to you. Good evening. I know. For, yeah. For me, it's Boker Tov, and for you, it's Laila Tov. Mm. It's a difference now that you are in mm -hmm. Israel, mm -hmm. joining us from Jerusalem. This is fantastic. I'm, I love technology. I love that you can be here on the show today. It's just wonderful. Science leads to technology, which leads to Blair being on Twiss Yay. For, you to, for you to enjoy, which I think is fabulous. So how has it been? How's the, uh, the transition going? It's good. Um, I'm still definitely jet lagged. I've been waking up early in the morning anyway, so I probably would have woken up close to six o'clock today, regardless of whether I was here or not. Um, I'm learning the area. I'm trying to learn enough Hebrew to buy things at the marketplace. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But uh, but yeah, I've I've learned a lot already, and uh, everyone here is really great. And 
all of the Israelis here are super friendly and they love seeing Americans and it's been it's been awesome so far. I, I think it's just great and uh, Israel is a hub for some amazing scientific research so maybe you'll, yeah. maybe you'll you'll be bringing us some cool stories straight out of Israel. Yeah. Yeah, some of the people doing the internships uh, with me here are doing research in labs, so I'm really excited to hear exactly what they're going to do and all that kind of stuff. I think it's going to be great. And uh, Justin's not joining us today, but this is This Week in Science, you know, the place where you come to hear the science news talked about ad nauseum for about an hour. And on this week's show, of course, as always, we have uh, a whole bunch of science stories. And uh, I brought stories about um, organic agriculture. Is it as good? Is it the panacea for health that uh, people think it actually is? Uh, bird funerals. That's right. Bird funerals. That's, that's what I said. World robot domination, some really ancient life, quantum transportation, and your genome. These are stories that I want to talk about today. Blair, My what's, genome? Yeah, your what, genome? Maybe our, <laughs> our genome. Okay. What we have in common. <laughs> How did you get my genome? No. Um. <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> I want to talk about tigers and... <clears throat> how they get along with humans taking over their space, which you would think tigers would just eat them, but no. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't quite work. All no. right. Yeah. All right. All right. I'm looking forward to it. I definitely am. So let's get talking. The story that I want to start with is the genome. The genome has been encoded. And by encoded, I mean uh, ENCODE, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. It is a project that was started shortly after the um, shortly after the human genome was first uh, sequenced and researchers have been working tirelessly to figure out what all the stuff in the genome really is and really does. So uh, the genome was sequenced and we and we found out that we had, yay, these three billion some odd nucleotides uh, within the human genome, 1.5% of which coded for proteins. 1.5% huh. out of billions. That's odd. Yeah, and so uh, the... The question is, what is all the rest of the stuff? And people have talked about it being junk DNA, that there's just a lot of stuff, repeated sequences, uh, bacterial sequences, uh, genes that have gotten interspersed with our, within our genome over millions of years of evolution, um, but that just don't do anything, don't have any purpose, and they're just there. So the question remains, uh, is that really true? what's actually going on. So ENCODE has been really trying to find out what is functional within the genome. And they came out with 30 papers. 30 papers. There's wow. a whole bunch, yeah, a whole bunch of papers. I mean, this is a massive effort that's been ongoing for years and years and years and years. And there are six papers in Nature, all by it, in the, in the journal Nature, all by itself. 30 papers across three different journals. Uh, uh, and all of these papers describe um, research that suggests that not 1.5%, but more like 80% of our genome is actually functional. And they, there are researchers uh, who, when interviewed, have suggested that that number, with further research, probably will get to 100%. So the, some of the researchers within this project actually think that our genome uh, that there isn't any junk in it, that all of it is used for some function or another, and that there are n really no mistakes within the within the entire genome. So, uh, yeah. So there's of course controversy in this uh, in this in this story. The uh, there are people who, as soon as they as soon as the eighty percent number came out, a lot of people jumped on that and said, "Well, what do you mean by?" functional? What's really functional? And so uh, their, um, their definition um, means that you, they have uh, functions that, that uh, are maybe 
a biochemical, a signal of biochemical activity, as well as actually coding for something. Um, there are, or maybe linking to something else. Uh, so we have uh, promoter regions that promote the expression of other genes that don't actually turn into to proteins themselves. We have regulator regions. We have um, regions that bind histones that uh, the right. DNA, our chromosomes wind around. And then, and, and in looking at the genome, they've found linkages between really uh, distant parts of the genome that they wouldn't expect to be linked. And so if you're thinking about it in a two-dimensional kind of text way, where you have a string of text, it doesn't make sense. And so you have to think of it in a more three-dimensional uh, structural form. And so maybe there's a lot uh, having to do with folding of the chromosome that ends up leading to the functions that uh, that we never gave things before. Uh -huh. So, so there's, yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, when you talk about eighty percent of the genome, do they count the telomeres in the um, the repeating section at the end? Uh, as part of the genome, or do they just consider that throwaway and they don't even count it? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. Because um, you think that would weigh bloat the amount of unused, which technically has a use, even if it doesn't code for stuff. protein. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has a huge use. It keeps you from essentially decaying and dying. So right. <laughs> it's an important function, even if it doesn't code for protein. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know if they actually, if if that's something that is included. I would imagine that they're just taking the chromosomes as they are and um, all of the nucleotides that are contained, whether or not it's repeating repeated segments like the telomeres at the ends. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do they even count that in a genome when they sequence a genome? Do you know? I I don't know. Hmm. That's a really good question. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> this is something that I cannot answer. <laughs> um, the what they were working on uh, is really fascinating in the way that they did it. So, um, the Human Genome Project, when they originally sequenced it, uh, they're just looking at like one cell from one person, right? They're just looking at the chromosomes from one cell. Well, we have thousands of different cell types within our bodies. And each okay. cell type expresses the genome differently, even though the genome uh, within it is pretty much the same. There's some small mutational differences from cell to cell to cell. And so um, in trying to figure out what everything uh, within the genome does and what its function is, uh, they looked at a total of uh, around 147 different cell types and compared those different cell types, the, the, the information that was found as a result of looking at those cell types uh, across the genome. And so they ended up with something over 1600, somewhere over 1600 different data sets that they, uh, that, that they were analyzing. And so even at 147 cell types, they're still looking at only a very small proportion of everything within the genome because there are still hundreds of different cell types that could be potentially analyzed um, that might have differences in what gets expressed, what functional units uh, become active, um, what becomes quiet, more quiescent. And so, um, so there's, some, there's some really just fascinating stuff going on here. And uh, yeah, I, the, the thing that I love the most is the idea that there's, there's really probably not very much junk in our genome after all. And I think that's just a, a mm -hmm. fascinating idea. It seems like over all of the millions of years that there's been evolution, it seems like there would, a, there would be a sorting out of the junk DNA. It doesn't seem like mm -hmm. we'd have that much anymore because if a section of DNA could be used for something that would be advantageous evolutionarily you'd think because right. rather than just having you know nonsense over here have it actually code for something no matter what it is I would think it would make sense for it to be advantageous 
in some mutation. So you'd think over these millions of years, eventually most of the genome would mean something, even if it didn't millions of years ago. Right, right. Yeah, there's um, there's some the, some interesting stuff as well that uh, researchers are hoping to be able to do with this now that they have this database. And some of, and one of the things that I think is most interesting. So they've got this this research that they, they these over sixteen hundred data sets that they've collected. Um, they're they're all publicly available so that researchers around the world can access them and be able to uh, peruse them. They've also in publishing this instead of uh, if you're interested in something, say, having to do with promoter sequences, you're not going to have to read all 30 p papers in those three different journals as a researcher. That takes a lot of time and energy and just things are all over the place and it's kind of kind of a hassle, right? They've actually created an app. They have a website and they have an app like for the iPhone or the iPad that um, makes it easy for you just to put in search terms and it selects the relevant sequ uh, segments of text out of the 30 different articles so that you don't have to do it yourself. Wow. And so that, yeah, so that as a research a searcher, you can easily access the information that's held in all of these articles and uh, be able to use it to your benefit more quickly and more easily. And, um, and, and so this and the data sets and the, the publishing method as well as how they're making the data available is going to be really useful for uh, disease research. So people who are trying to figure out whether or not there's some kind of genetic mutation related to a certain disease, um, maybe that's involved with like an on-off switch for, uh, for gene expression. Um, it'll, it'll make accessing that information and searching for links much easier. Some people, uh, John Timmer, I believe over in at Ars Technica, he wrote that it's also going to lead to maybe a lot of false positives that people are going to find links where maybe there aren't any just because they're looking for them because they've got all this information out there and so um, researchers are just going to need to be very uh, parsimonious about how they use the the data and the information, but this is really truly one of the efforts that I think is spearheading our data-rich future that will actually lead us to understanding more about our genome and who we are and how it works. Hmm, that sounds great. I don't know. I'm excited about it. I think it's really cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Science. Yes. <laughs> Genomes. Yes. Um, normally, Justin would do a story right now, and I didn't ask you to get any other stories together, so we can switch off. If you, but I can just throw something else out there. We can move to the next topic. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Moving on to the next topic. So, uh, news out of University of Stanford, or Stanford University, just a little south of San Francisco. Uh, this past week, there is a systematic review study that uh, has been published by a group from uh, Stanford in the Annals of Internal Medicine, looking at the difference between organic and conventional foods mm -hmm. uh, with respect to health benefits. And so the result from this study and I'm it's not they didn't they didn't do a study themselves they went out to the literature and looked at what was out there published in trade journals in scientific journals what's out in the literature and they uh, using very stringent uh, stringent uh, parameters they chose the studies they thought could actually uh, were actually good science that were actually doing well-controlled studies and that could be compared against each other. Because um, very often a, a researcher putting a study together, you know, you just do a study. You ask a question and you don't necessarily think about how it fits into the, the broader uh, community of publications and how that can be, uh, how it could be easily compared systematically and so not everything can be used and they had to throw out a whole bunch of stuff but they came up with uh, several hundred uh, studies 237 relevant studies to analyze wow. seven, yeah uh, 17 
Um, these included 17, popula 17 studies of populations consuming organic and conventional diets, 223 studies that compared either the nutrient levels or the bacterial, fungal, or pesticide contamination of various products uh, growing organically and conventionally. And there were no long-term studies of health outcomes, and the durations of the studies ranged from two days to two years that involved human subjects. Two so, days? <laughs> two days. We're going to find a bit. Eat this now, really? and we'll test you tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, their study found that there was scant evidence in the studies that they found uh, appropriate for this analysis. Uh, there was very little evidence that there were any differences in health benefits between organic and conventional foods and no real differences were seen in the nutritional profiles of the foods either. Uh, phosphorus was significantly higher. Phosphorus and in another report, I think uh, nitrogen were significantly higher in organic versus uh, I think it was phosphorus was higher in organic, and maybe nitrogen was higher in conventional uh, foods, um, and that uh, that was pretty much the only difference. Uh, the researchers, being uh, doctors, they said that the phosphorus being higher in organic, very few people are deficient in phosphorus in the first place, so that. A difference for you. Um, there was limited evidence, though, that organic milk might have higher levels of omega 3s. So, if you're interested in omega 3s, huh. organic milk might be good. Um, the <laughs> they the only evidence is that uh, so when looking at it, you think maybe not health benefits. So maybe there aren't higher nutrient levels in the different foods, organic versus uh, conventional, but what about pesticides, right? So pesticides, are you going, are you being exposed to more pesticides? Researchers found that organic produce had a 30% lower risk of pesticide contamination and organic foods that were studied are not were not necessarily 100% pesticide free. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the pesticide tisk, tisk. <laughs> yeah, and the pesticide levels of all foods that were studied generally fell within safety limits. Uh, so whether or not it was conventional or organic, they were falling. the The food was within allowable limits for pesticide consumption or exposure. Uh, there were two studies of, according to this, uh, this science blog story, there were two studies of children consuming organic and conventional diets, and the urine of the children on organic diets had lower, significantly lo lower amounts of pesticide residues in the, in the urine. But they don't really, they didn't follow the kids, so there's no uh, actual data on whether or not there were health effects resulting from higher pesticide levels in the urine of the conventional produce huh. children. Um, and there's also questions about uh, exposure to antibi antibiotic resistant bacteria, but n which uh, organic food reduces your exposure and nobody really knows the significance of that either. So there's, uh, there, are, there are big questions, question marks still raised about long-term benefits, whether or not long-term exposure to pesticides is um, with organic food is going to be better, but there are, you know, other personal choices that might lead somebody to choose organic over conventional that might not be related to health. But anyway. So just to clarify, so there was no health benefits that they could see in the studies, but a lot of the fruits and vegetables had higher phosphorus and milk had higher omega-3s, right? Yes, yes. So ultimately, that would indicate that there's a plus to eating organic, even if we can't see it physically in the people that we look at, right? Possibly. But I Ultimately, mean, all yeah. I will say is that I think a lot of organic, especially fruits, but also vegetables, taste better. So if it tastes better, and on top of that, it has better 
uh, vitamins in it. It has more vitamins in it. That sounds like a win-win to me. But it doesn't have more vitamins. It just maybe okay, has more vitamins. phosphorus. Yeah. It has yeah. maybe more phosphorus, and that's it. The okay, vitamin, so no the vitamin. Vitamins. Yeah, they don't have the the taste might be better. It might have more sugars, or there might be farming methods or in the organic farms that do lead to the food tasting better. And there could also be a, a personal bias. So when you buy organic, mm, that's true. you know, you tell yourself it's going to taste better because you're right. spending way more money on it. This better taste yeah, better. that's true. <laughs> I wonder if, um, how I, I know people have done taste tests before. I wonder what the result of that would be if they did a bigger scale one because I think they've been pretty low scale. Yeah. But that would be interesting to see in combination with that. But also, it would be cool to see who is actually pesticide free because I've wondered that too. I have often wondered, is this really pesticide free or are you just saying that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. How much of them really, really, I mean, a lot of them still have pesticides, so yeah, That's pesticide true. residues yeah. and and the uh, the nutrients are definitely going to you know the different soil is going to affect nutrients, mm -hmm. um, different water, right. different harvesting methods, different planting methods, different you know just different farming methods in general. Um, right. You know, it was my understanding also, though, that the amount of time in between when a fruit or vegetable is picked and when it gets to your plate, yes. that the nutrients yeah. degrade that whole time. And so for a lot of grocery store vegetables and fruits, it's it takes a long time for that to get to you. Sometimes it comes from Mexico, but other, you know, in theory, a lot of organic produce that you're eating, even though that might not be true if you go to Trader Joe's or something, but if you go to yeah. um, a farmer's market, that's usually pretty close to you. And so I would think that that's a whole nother category of research is not just whether it's organic or not, but how far it has traveled to get to your plate. Yeah. Yeah. How far, because, how far it travels is definitely going to yeah. be a factor. And um, for super you know, for the big grocery stores, for the mega stores right. that are buying lots and lots of produce and having it, uh, having to ship it over really long distances, they're going to be harvesting before things are ripe. Things are going right. to be taking longer to get to the uh, get to the stores. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. yeah, I would rather buy something that was not organic that was at a farmer's market than buy the organic produce at a grocery store because of that. And I, I think you're. Yeah, and I think you're probably um, uh, you're probably onto something there. And if you're mm. really if you're really thinking about you know not just yourself but uh, more um, sustainable issues, right. uh, yeah. so just uh, sustainable agriculture, sustainable marketing, sustainable sustainable just how it, how the whole picture fits together. Uh, local is often going to be a big part of that solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're on to something. Cool. Everybody, if you just tuned in, this is This Week in Science, and I'm Dr. Kiki, and here with Blair Bezdarch, who is in Jerusalem, and the sun's coming up finally. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I think it's about time for Blair's Animal Corner with Blair, likes hippos, not pandas, almost works at the Jerusalem Zoo. Yes, yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Um, all right, so I have a story about tigers. Tigers are one of those uh, megafauna that's an apex predator that when they have to live with humans or near humans, it becomes a problem. We don't have a lot of our apex predators in the United States because it's so hard to live with them around humans. So, you know, bears, a lot of wolves, we don't have them in a lot of um, populated areas because it becomes dangerous for humans and then the humans have to move or dispose of those predators because of that, because of territory mm -hmm. issues. So what's really interesting is they looked at tigers in Nepal and they found that tigers were actually doing what they called in the article, quote unquote, taking the night shift mm -hmm. in order to avoid their human neighbors. <clears throat> and tigers normally they sleep up to 20 hours a day but not all at once so they'll wake up throughout the day and night and be active and look for food they're not really diurnal or nocturnal but what they found in Chitwan National Park in Nepal 
was that they were actually walking on the exact same humans as opposed to um, any other animals. Right. So you can actually see on these camera traps very clearly that there are people on these paths during the day and tigers in the exact same place at night. And they only looked at about 121 tigers that they camera trapped in this one place. So I don't know if this is just a singular phenomenon or if this is happening in other places on the planet. Unfortunately, we don't have that many tigers left in the wild. So uh -huh. it's difficult to say if this is something that all tigers would do. They We started in the start of the 20th century with about 100,000 tigers in the wild as our estimate. Oh no, what just happened? Did I break it? I think I broke it. Ah, what happened? It was going so well. <sighs> Internet. Are we back? What is this? What is this? Why is it this week in science? I was kicked out. And now I am back. I do not understand. Blair! Yay! Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I cut out. What did I say? Uh, 120 tigers... Oh, 100,000 tigers. 100,000 tigers. <clears throat> There's only 3,000 left now. Living with humans has probably edited out all the tigers that are going to try to challenge humans in the area because they got shot. So these 3,000 tigers are the ones who figured out how to live around humans probably. So that might be why we're seeing this, because the only ones that we see are the ones that aren't challenging humans. That's my hypothesis. Okay, so the ones that are surviving are the ones who are just getting out Taking of the game, the night basically. Shift. Yeah, getting yeah. out of the game, basically. Yeah. They've that's, learned the I mean, lesson. At least in this area, that's what makes sense to me, is maybe the reason that they're seeing this is because this is how to survive as a tiger around humans, because otherwise you will get killed by a human. If you, hmm. if you go into a human area and there's a human around with a gun, especially in Nepal, you're not going to survive as a tiger. Yeah, in, the, in terms of what why people kill tigers, there's the... I, there's the self-defense. There's a tiger mm -hmm. around, so it's very likely that that tiger will kill me. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm going to kill it first. There's probably a fur fur trade, right? Claws, a little bit, yeah. Claws, teeth, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that there's probably like something in the Chinese market for like you know tiger gallbladder. Right. Well, I know um, in Nepal and a lot of um, the Himalayas too. Big cats, tigers, and snow leopards are uh, killed because they think that it's a threat to their livestock. Yeah. So they'll go out of their way to try to find these guys and get rid of them preemptively to avoid getting their livelihood essentially eaten. Yeah, and that, that, that's happening here in, in Yellowstone with, uh, with mm -hmm. wolves. We have that same exact issue. So whenever you have one of the keystone predators, the ones that are at the top of the food chain, uh, People are worried, and, and people's livelihoods depend on, right. you know, how active those predators yeah. are. Yeah, that's going to be yeah. a huge, huge influence. How, yeah. so, so when they're doing the, the night shift, do you think these tigers yes. are then going and hunting the livestock? Yeah. Are they, they oh. going into the farms, or are they, are they doing, do you think they're doing... You know, I don't know about um, that. I do know that snow leopards in the Himalayas uh, will go for livestock, but that's because a lot of the people there are doing not the smartest um, prevention from their animals getting eaten by snow leopards because they'll use a side of a mountain as one of the containing walls for their herd, which mm -hmm. basically is just a snow leopard ramp into their herd. <laughs> um but I don't know about the tiger specifically. Um, but one thing I do think that's really interesting about this is that because they're shifting when they hunt, mm 
-hmm. potentially that's totally changing their prey. Right, what they're eating. There's a, yeah. there's a whole prey item. There's several prey items probably that, that are diurnal that they would eat in the wild that now mm -hmm. they're not eating. And the mm -hmm. huge problem with that potentially is that that could mess up with the population control of those predators or those, right, those uh, prey species. items. Excuse yeah. me, yeah. yeah. Those prey items suddenly don't have a control for their population. That could be a big problem. That's really interesting. Yeah. So this kind of a shift could lead to some major shifts within the food web, within the ecosystem. Totally. But you'd think that you would have, I guess they're seeing this behavior now, so they mm -hmm. should probably already be seeing the effects of right. the decreased tiger populations and and the change in their behaviors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just thought that was really interesting in terms of an effect on, I, I never would have thought that tigers would adjust their behavior to humans. Yeah. I just never would have expected that. And yeah. just a predator in general. Because a tiger changing. is a tiger. <laughs> yeah, they are pretty hardwired to do what they do. Yeah. But apparently they, they can adapt just like anybody else. It's pretty cool. Good to know. Adapt mm -hmm. or die. Tigers mm -hmm. do it too. Yeah. Uh, well, we are at the halfway point in the show, and so we're going to take a really quick break so I can read a few uh, little messages. And when we come back, we will be uh, talking about bird funerals. Ever been to a bird funeral? No. <laughs> <laughs> Can't say that. Can't I have. say that. I, no. I know. Yeah. All right. So we'll be back in just a few moments. All righty. Twist has a, has a sponsor. Audible.com. Audible is leading provider of audiobooks. And those audiobooks, they have hundreds of thousands, 100,000 in their library. Lots and lots in their library for you to choose from. Uh, lots of gen genres as well. You can choose anything you like. But we always suggest science because we think science is fantabulous. And um, if you haven't thought of it, Listening to audiobooks on your commute at maybe one and a half times speed or even double time speed could be a great way to get some of those, those books uh, into your head that you've been putting off. So you can try Audible books, audiobooks. It's just great. You, and the science books, good for you, good for your brain. Start a free trial today. Get a free audiobook download. Anything you choose, all you have to do is sign up. That's it. Get one free audiobook of your choice. Sign up at audiblepodcast.com slash twist. That's right. That's it. Go there right now. Audiblepodcast.com slash twist and get yourself a free audiobook download. Twist also has merchandise that you might enjoy. Head over to twist.org to purchase our 2010 science music compilation CD and a World Robot Domination t-shirt if merchandise is your thing. If it's not... We do appreciate donations to keep us going. Uh, Twist is supported by listeners like you. Your donations pay for our hosting, bandwidth, contractors we need to hire, fun things that we try to do for the show. And we do appreciate any amount that you're able to give. And any amount, $1 to $1 million, you make this show possible. We accept donations through PayPal. We have buttons on just about every page of our website, twist.org, and we've made the process really easy. Uh, so go to the website, maybe listen to the most, most recent episode, comment on the show, and make a donation. Click, hit one of those pink buttons that's on the page. We thank you for your support. We really couldn't do it without you. All right, back to the show. This is This Week in Science. I'm Dr. Kiki, and uh, we are talking about science, as we like to do. 
And the story that's up next on the on the docket is a little bit about death. There's there is death. It's part of life, and uh, as humans, we have funerals. We have mm -hmm. rites that we observe when people die. And it's been observed that there are different species of animals that also have um, certain behaviors that occur when members of their social groups die. Giraffes, elephants, for example. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, you're probably really familiar with, and with some of those examples, right, Blair? Mm, yeah, for sure. Um, elephants definitely do what can be described as mourning the dead, but it's very difficult to say. Basically, they've seen elephants stop in front of a dead elephant or elephant bones, and they'll kind of hang out and just watch it and look at it before they move on, even mm. if they didn't know the elephant, which they've called mourning. It's also possible that they see a dead elephant and they're surveying their surroundings to make sure that it's not dangerous. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. What else are you looking at? What's actually mm -hmm. going on? It's difficult uh, to say what's going on in their heads, but it looks like mourning to humans, I guess. Yeah. We like, we like <laughs> to anthropomorphize a little bit. Definitely. Yeah, it happens. It happens. Mm -hmm. So uh, a researcher from UC Davis actually uh, published in the journal Animal Behavior this past week researched that when uh, friends of mine were talking about this research getting started, I was like, come on, you're crazy. I was like, really? Like a, a good friend of mine also in graduate school, she was excited. She's like, hey, there's a researcher who at, uh, in the animal behavior department who's who wants to look at um, funeral behavior in scrub jays, a species of bird. And I was like, in a bird, in a scrub jay, and I've worked with scrub jays. I know they're smart birds, but I was totally skeptical of this, totally skeptical. And now they've published a paper on their results. Uh, they put dead scrub jays in my, in my friend's backyard. It was one of many backyards that was used as their, uh, their setting for these experiments. Um, they alternated. They used uh, dead bodies, dead bird bodies. They used uh, just wooden objects as a control. They also put a, uh, a predator, uh, a model of a predator like an owl uh, in, in the backyard as well, uh, and looked at the behavior of scrub jays in the local area when they noticed that these objects or whether they noticed these objects were uh, were in their territories these are these, wild scrub jays wild scrub jays this all took wow. place in nature in the natural environment there was That's absolutely amazing. yeah there was no manipulation other than just putting the the wooden object a dead bird or a predator model into the uh, environment and just watching what the wild animals did. So, I was call me I was a skeptic. I was totally a skeptic. I didn't think anything was going to come of this. But boy, howdy was I wrong. So, they found that uh, scrub jays don't pay any attention when a random wooden object is put into their environment. That makes sense. There's not really any reason for them to pay any attention to a random wooden object unless that wooden object is doing something that might affect them which it, they weren't. When a model of a predator, like an owl, were, was placed, the birds would swoop down on that, that model and they would uh, do attack behaviors, which is very common among scrub jays. There were also warning calls. So scrub jays warning other members of the uh, scrub jay population that uh, there was a predator in the environment. Um, the dead bird was the most interesting, however. They did not swoop down the way that they swooped down to the predator, but they did start giving out warning calls. Um, additionally, they gathered around the dead bird as if they were surveying the environment, um, and the calls seemed to bring more scrub jays in. Than were there initially, uh, and they stopped all foraging behavior and would not forage for at least a day after seeing the dead bird in their in their habitat. So, 
whether or not you can call the gathering of the scrub jays a uh, you know a funeral in the human sense, <clears throat> anthropomorphizing, you know, is is definitely you know the the question. Uh, the researchers say that um, uh, what did they what did they write? They say. Um, the Jays see the presence of a dead bird as information to be publicly shared just as they do the presence of a predator. Spreading the message that a dead bird is in the area helps safeguard other birds, alerting them to danger and lowering their risk from whatever killed the original bird in the first place. So, huh. so it's an interesting behavior in a social animal. Scrub Jays are very social birds. Um, they do... Uh, you know, work together. They live. They they they. Um, there has been a lot of research that suggests that they are uh, highly, um, I guess, not highly into independent birds. That they actually work together. They will help out family members, related individuals, depending on the population. Um, and that something like this, this kind of behavior, would help the group. Huh. Kind of adaptive. Adaptive behavior right. for the group. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, did they use, they? where did they get the scrub jays that were dead, do you know? Were they wild <laughs> scrub jays that were dead? Or were um, they... I, I don't think that they were scrub jays that they found dead somewhere. I know <laughs> that there had, there were research birds, uh, so they might have been been trapped and they might have died in captivity. They, I don't think that they just found them dead. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I just I'm wonder if there would sure be a difference works. between a scrub jay that they've met before and a right. scrub jay that's a stranger scrub jay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, and I don't think that their research was able to uh, approach, address that question. Right, if you're using wild to, birds, that'd be yeah. very difficult to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you'd really have, you'd have to be going out, you'd catch a member of a certain population, you'd have to know the population in a particular area, uh, you would have to specifically catch individuals and kill them, and mm -hmm. then, or uh, drug them so that they seemed dead or injured, uh, and then see how other members of the population responded, and yeah... Yeah, I don't think that's not the, that's not the way that it worked. That's not the yeah. way that the study. <laughs> that's really interesting, though. There's so much scrub jays. Do they live in in large groups that are pretty exclusive, or do you think that they? I don't know that much about scrub jays. Uh, scrub jays are they they do they're kind of like uh, like crows where they do. They go off do their own thing. They but go they off have and do neighbors. their own thing. They have neighbors. They definitely are aware of the other members of their population. They're not like living in, you know, living in the same hole in a tree. You know, you don't have a, right. you don't have the Western scrub jay, the species they were looking at, um, isn't, you know, isn't, it's not a tight knit group, but mm -hmm. they definitely work together. They right. know they know their social their social uh, comrades. It's interesting though because it's kind of an altruistic behavior if it's for um, if it if the reason that they're gathering together is to survey the area and make sure nobody gets hurt. It's interesting that they would go out of their way to call others to make sure that they all know there's a threat in the area, as opposed to just noticing yeah. for yourself and then I can have your food if you die. <laughs> yeah, and the so the Florida scrub jay has been studied quite a bit because Flor the Florida scrub jay, uh, related birds, so the offspring of uh, two birds, will stay around the nest and help with their parents' next uh, brood of chicks because they're, you know, they found that there aren't necessarily enough mates to go around and there aren't necessarily enough good territories to go around. And so it's an evolutionarily adaptive strategy to help with the uh, increase the fitness of your, uh, of your brothers and sisters mm -hmm. oh, right. okay. helping out at the nest. And so in the Florida scrub jays, that's something that has been, it's been 
tested and modeled and that's they have evidence that supports that um, the Western scrub jay however there's all sorts of territory there are plenty of mates to go around and so uh, they don't have that kind of a specific familial bond uh, right. binding them together however within a population you are going to have a large number of interrelated individuals I would imagine and so right yeah so it, it it is interesting the kind of the group survival strategies we've talked about yeah. them before yeah what, right who, yeah who the trade-off yeah yeah exactly the percentage of related genes and how helpful you're going to be based on that percentage <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah. Zachary in the chat room just said it's a natural social network. Right. <laughs> exactly. exactly. It is. <laughs> That's awesome. For the birds. Yeah, so uh, bird funerals. They might have them. It's very <laughs> who knows? Who knows? We can anthropomorphize yeah. some more. Uh, ready for some world robot domination? Yes, please. Excellent. So DARPA funded research, this is the Pentagon uh, funded research, uh, to create a, a robot that sprints like a cheetah. And so this robot that can sprint like a cheetah was just, uh, was just tested in 10 miles per hour or 44.7 kilometers per hour. Uh, this machine, which has no head, it has four legs and a bunch of wires attached to it, power wires because of the battery issue which we've discussed related to robots before. Um, this robot reached 28.3 miles per hour when tested on a treadmill for how fast it could go and it's been modeled specifically on the cheetah which has the land speed record for mammals. Mm -hmm. It's much higher than that though, it's almost double that. Yeah, so cheetahs can run a lot faster, and there's uh, a video available. Um, there's a link through the BBC. There's a video available that, uh, if you look for it, you can see the cheetah run, and you can definitely see that there are. It's not quite right, even though they have used uh, the cheetah as the model of how this robot should run. They haven't quite gotten it yet. It's it's a, uh -huh. still a little bit jerky. It's still not as smooth as a, as a cheetah, um, right. which probably, you know, uh, which probably relates to why it cannot yet reach the speeds of a cheetah. Um, and so according to DARPA, the aim is to more effectively, uh, the aim is to more effectively assist war fighters across a greater range of missions. I don't know exactly how a fast cheetah is going to do that, but that's why, th that's what they did. They huh. built it. Yes. Um, don't you think they're just trying to make robot soldiers? Yeah, I think so. A really fast okay. robot, you know, they're, they're just going to make, yeah, a really fast cheetah-like robot soldier that yeah. can run after you. <laughs> right. The army is going to hunt you down and kill you with a cheetah robot. Yeah. Not so exciting. Not so exciting. So our world robot future <laughs> will be dominated by fast robots, which to date are not quite as fast as regular cheetahs, but they're unfortunately getting there. Uh, the <laughs> DARPA's next hope, of course, is that they can take this robot and, uh, and try it out in the field in 2013. So next year, they're hoping to get it off the treadmill and into the wild to see how it does. We shall see. Well, then you have to make the thing all terrain, which is going to be so difficult. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Because it's one thing to get land speed, but it's another to get land speed on uneven ground that isn't smooth. Yeah, exactly. So there's uh, there are robots like Big Dog, which mm -hmm. have been created to be able to deal with very uneven terrain. Big Dog, you, if you've ever seen it, it looks like this very ungainly, strange, headless, four-legged animal, but it's able to... to right itself uh, when right. going down a rocky hillside into a ravine. It's able to walk very well on surfaces that no robot should be able to walk on. 
Yeah, so what we need to do is get Big Dog and this cheetah robot and put on some slow music. <laughs> <laughs> bow, chicka, bow, bow. <laughs> yeah. Zing, zing. Got to get the sound of drills in there, right? Of course. <laughs> Screwdrivers, drills. Oh, my goodness. Um, the, the other most interesting story uh, from this week is a story um, related to mind-controlled legs. Mm. That's right, which is really not just for robots. This is going to be how uh, humans might be able to fight back against the robot masters with our prosthetic robot legs. Mm. So they, these legs will be controlled by our minds and the uh, researchers at uh, where is it? They are da, 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 Long Beach Veteran Affairs Medical Center have built and tested a prosthetic lower limb that can be controlled simply by EEG or electroencephalogram which is just if you wear a little cap and uh, if you wear a cap that can read your brain signals, the electrical signals from your brain, then that gets fed into a computer and the computer reads those signals to control a device. Um, they tested the limb, the, the, these robotic limbs on a, a subject who had had some training with a virtual avatar system previously, but this person who uh, does not have any paralysis was an able-bodied able subject. This person mastered the system in 10 minutes and had absolutely no unintended steps. So uh, the researchers say by the end of the experiment, the subject had no false alarms. And false alarms are something that if you're creating a robotic prosthesis for paralysis victims for people who cannot move their limbs a false step is something that could really injure you because if you're wearing these heavy robotic legs um, and you misstep then you could fall and not be able to catch yourself appropriately and hurt yourself even even worse than you've already been injured so this is really an important step in uh, in this kind of research uh, developing technology for robotic uh, legs. The team is very excited. Yeah. The is test their system on someone who actually has a spinal cord injury. That's something they have not done yet. And to show that uh, from a power point of view that it's practical because that also is a main con is a concern. So computing, can you miniaturize the computer? Does somebody have to be hooked up to a, mm. you know, a tower? <laughs> can, is, is it something that you can right. pack into a small space that someone can walk around with? And then if they're walking around with it, what's your power source? How long is it going to last? How big is that power source? These are all, uh, all things that need to be addressed in this kind of research development. That's so cool. That's if we could have robotic prosthetics that are controlled by our brain. Cause we just had, um, with monkeys, we had research a couple months ago where monkeys could control a prosthetic arm, right? With right. their brain. Yes. That's fantastic. So this is just another step. We're almost there. Yeah. So the, the actual ability, uh, to con, Controlling the, the the movements of a prosthesis is something that is becoming more and more possible. And I think as more and more groups are working on the prosthetic uh, robot mm -hmm. idea, you're going to get better translation of the brain signals, cleaner translation. You're going to have better resolution so that uh, the movements maybe are a lot cleaner and uh, not very jerky, actually more natural. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it, we're we're not quite there yet, but it's definitely we might actually amazing. see robotic prosthetics in our lifetime. That's mind blowing and amazing. No, we we totally will see. Yeah, that's absolutely like what George Lucas thought of in Star Wars. We might actually have, you know, the 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 mechanical hand that Luke Skywalker had. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's always what I think about is how. You, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then and then it's all about Gundam 
so that right. we can all have, you know, our our power suit. Right. Hee 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 hee. Oh, I'm on reserve battery power too, so <laughs> Well, we are about, we're almost done, right? We're almost done. Uh, okay. I just have one more quick story. Uh, hit ya. Last story. Uh, signs of really, really, really old life. Extremely Ooh. ancient life. So one of the big questions is how, when did the first life arise on our planet Earth, right? How long ago did, um, did life Get its start, and uh, approximately 3.7 billion years ago, we were ending the late heavy bombardment, which is when we were just you know attacked by space, and our Earth was a mass of just molten stuff. There was we were hot and and liquid and not in any uh, suitable shape for life, right? So, there must have been cooling, and then how did, when did life get its start? We have, uh, we have evidence, 2.7 billion years ago, absolutely unambiguous evidence of complex bacterial populations, communities. And so, uh, they, they, the evidence is in the form of what's called stromatolites, which are microbial biofilms. And these biofilms uh, can be get laid down in sediments in coastal environments. So, what this suggests is about 2.7 million years ago, there was water on the surface. These um, biofilms at the, uh, the land-water interface, they're, they're uh, maybe sitting on a rock or some piece of, of earth and just get it make a thin film and then maybe some earth gets over put over them and then maybe another layer of uh, bacterial communities and they sediment over and over again and so we have these rocks they look like rocks but really they are a fossil record of uh, bacterial life over millions of years really cool stuff so 2.7 billion years ago Unambiguous uh -huh. evidence. Uh -huh. Research in 2006 suggested that 3.5 billion years ago, uh, there was life in bacterial communities, such that, as I just described, uh, in pools that are found in Australia. Now, a new study looking at sulfur isotopes, uh, differences in how much uh, sulfur was laid down by organisms. It does, doesn't necessarily imply that it was biological, but because of these, the ratios of sulfur isotopes that they analyzed, they basically took these rocks and they uh, went layer by layer looking at the sediments and checked to see what kind of variations there were in these sulfur isotope ratios. And they suggest that the evidence is very, very strong in the direction of uh, it being actual microbial life 3.5 billion years ago, which puts the start of life on our planet. It was like as soon as the surface of the planet was cold enough, cool enough and hospitable enough in any way, life got its start. So it really, this kind of a study, it doesn't say that undisputably there was life 3.5 billion years ago, but it says... If there was, like, life will go. <laughs> as soon as life has a spot, life will happen. So that, it's, it's just a really neat study. And wow. it's in uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Wow. Life. That's, yeah. Life will find a way, huh? Exactly. Exactly. All right, Miss Reserve Power. That's all I had. So we are at okay, the great. end of the show. And on next week's show, we will be back once again uh, using Google Plus Hangouts on air uh, to broadcast live to YouTube live. Uh -huh, and you'll uh -huh. be able to find us by following us on all the social media outlets. Uh, you can specifically follow my account, Kiki Sanford, on Google Plus, And you can also follow... This Week in Science on Google+. Plus. And you can find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash thisweekinscience. And I don't Yay. have any shout-outs. Shout-outs to everyone. And shout-outs to Blair for... Shout-outs to scientists for making technology that allowed Blair to come yes. join us today. 
That's so awesome. I'm sorry. I was typing. Hold on. I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm getting there. She's like, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, okay. uh-huh. Okay, I'm sorry. What was the last thing you said? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Shoutouts. It's your turn to say thanks. Oh, thank you for listening. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We hope you enjoyed the show. We're also a podcast, so you can search for This Week in Science in iTunes, or if you have an Android device, you can look for Twist for Droid app in the Android Marketplace. And we're also on um, iPods and iPhones now as a This Week in Science app. Twist. That's right. And for more information yeah. on anything Twist. that you've heard here today, show notes are going to be available on our website, twist.org. Blair has been hard at work during the last hour as we've been doing the show, getting the show notes together. We also want to hear from you, so email us. I'm Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. And Blair, you have a Gmail address too, don't you? Yes, I'm BlairBaz at gmail.com. Very easy. And if any of you guys did make a donation to my trip and you want to email me your address once I figure out where a post office is you may end up with a postcard so just I'm throwing that out there awesome and in those emails make sure you include twists or you're gonna get spam filtered into oblivion that's right and you can also follow us on twitter at dr kiki at jacksonfly did you already say that yep. at blair's menagerie and we have at twist science yes uh, and if uh and we're going to be back here next week. Wait, where am I? Here I am. We're going to be back here next week, and we do hope that you will join us once again for more great science news. And if you learned anything from the show today, remember... Dun, dun, dun. It's all in your head. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer, and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. Jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got the eye Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought and I'll try to answer any question you've got. So how can I ever see the changes I seek when I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way. You better just listen to what we say. And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said, then please just remember it's all in your head. Cause it's this week in science, this week in science. 
This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in 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 science. And there's a little bit of that that hum coming yeah. from there. She is. The I made hum. it through the um, the show. Through the, the show. Hum, the hum. Through the show. That's the important part, right? I just know yes. to pre-charge my computer now. I didn't know that before, so I'll fix it. Okay. Yeah, because the uh, yeah the adapter. Hum. Mm. Hum. It's converting. Converting energy. I'm trying to see usable. where I live on this map so you, I can show you guys. Oh, that'd be cool. I want to see. Oh, where are I you? I live right here. Okay, so I live... Ooh, look, I have a real map. I live right there. I live right mm -hmm. next to Mahen Yehuda, which is the Yehuda Street Market. What's that green stuff across the highway? Green stuff across... Where? Is it a park or something? There's lots of parks. I went running in the park the other day. Is that a park that's right near you? Yes, I do have a park right near me. It, yeah. Blair just experienced sunrise in Jerusalem. I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's very warm here. Very, very warm. Oh, I bet. You know what I could do? I wonder if we could do... <laughs> Thinking... <laughs> Yes, I used to live close to Kiki. <laughs> yeah, used to, like 10 minutes away. Now, yeah. not so much. Now it's more like 6,000 miles. <laughs> Is that how far it is? I should look it up. San Francisco. <laughs> miles to San Francisco. To Jerusalem. How many miles? Let's see. We're going to look for Jerusalem. This is... We're going to have a map. Is that the map of Jerusalem? There we go. We're in Jerusalem. Let's screen share Jerusalem. Yay. Now we will all work together. Aha. Uh -huh. ah. There we go. So let's, we'll, we'll move out a little bit so that if you want to get a generaler, generaler? <laughs> a good idea of where Jerusalem is with respect to the rest of the world. <coughs> Excuse me. We have Lebanon to the north of Israel, Jordan, which is a very... Jordan has a very interesting president, actually. Uh, we have Syria, Iraq, Egypt. I mean, this is all part of the, the breadbasket area from years back. The Nile Delta down going through Egypt. This is like where you are is like the seat of humanity. Like there's, <laughs> there's there's history. There's history where you are. So let's scroll in and see where she is. Scrolling, scrolling. Mm -hmm. Jerusalem. Distance. How far is it to the Dead Sea? Have you did you go to the Dead Sea? Um, I did the last time I was here, but there was a giant snowstorm, so I didn't get to go to the actual Dead Sea. I was just mm. right near it. Um, but I'm I'm fairly close to the Dead Sea. Um, mm. It's yeah, it's not in Jerusalem, but it's it's a short bus ride. I mean, the entire country mm -hmm. is the size of New Jersey, so it's, wow, yeah, it's I think it's like tiny. four or five hours from tip to tip. It's a super tiny country, so you can go pretty much anywhere. Okay, so let's start again as to where you are. Where okay. are you? <laughs> okay, where approximate you? distance as the crow flies in miles from San Francisco to Jerusalem is 7,432 miles. That's even more than I thought. 7,000? Nice. Yeah. So, I'm trying to think how I could tell you where I am. So, if you find... What should I look for? Um, well, it's hard on the satellite. Okay, so... I can just put your address in. 
Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Um, although nobody can Whoa. send a mail there, really. It won't work. But you can Google search. Um, here, I'll put it in the chat room. It's Give me. Zichron Tuvia. Six is my address. Do you find it? Hold on. That's how it's spelled. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. So it's it's um, slightly west of uh, the Temple Mount, and it's um, right. it's squished in between the Knesset and the Temple Mount. If you know what the Knesset does, is that's the Parliament Building. There's my arrow. Come back. Did you find it? Did I'm the, getting there. Hold on. Okay. You can also probably Google. There we go. Mahena. There we go. Tuvia. Yehuda. You can also Google that. Yes, I'm very safe. Don't worry, everyone. <laughs> Be safe. I'm super safe. I feel very safe where I am. Good. So. Gazelle Valley. Gazelle Valley. Close. I'm really far from the zoo, though. It's going to be a long bus ride for me. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, Jerusalem's seven miles by seven miles, so it's exactly this, like the size of San Francisco. So it's not too bad. It's not too bad, but it could be an hour across town. On the bus, it could. Yeah. yeah. It's not. It's not all the way from corner to corner. It's like a long the bottom square. Okay, mm. yeah, you're close. You're very close. <laughs> There's Zikron Yosef. Yeah. <laughs> you can search the other thing I put in there. Um, Mahana Yehuda. That's like a, a marketplace. we got to... Okay. Dun, 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 dun. The marketplace. That'll be a good thing to look for. Uh, don't that's, ride the buses. The I have to ride the buses there, Ulysses. I'm sorry. There's no way around it. <laughs> um, I think you're not supposed to ride the buses, like, in the middle of Israel, when you don't know where you are, but it's fine in Jerusalem. It's super safe to ride the public transit here. Awesome. I'm here for five to six months. Guest. <laughs> Yehuda. Mahen, Mahana Yehuda. That's what I said. There we are. Yeah, there so, we are. If you find. Is that right? I'm trying to see. see. Yes, you're very, very close. It's pretty much right in the center there. The Mahana Yehuda, right here. Yes, right here. Perfect. In the That's center. where I live. I live okay. literally a half a block from there. Cool. Yeah. Near the university. Um, you could ride a bike uh -huh. here, um, but I <laughs> am not a bike rider, let's say. <laughs> Did growing up in San Francisco have anything to do with that? Probably. I've tried to learn many <laughs> times, but I think it might have been all the hills. <laughs> Uh, it's yeah. not a great place. No, you gotta find a big parking lot if you're gonna learn. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, so where? Let me see. Where is the zoo? Where am I looking for the zoo? It is here. the lower west corner. It is where the zoo is. There's a garden. There's a cemetery. Do I need to go further? That's out into the country. This looks like farmland. What's the Is name of um, the big street on the bottom there? There we go. Go back in. If 
you see Gilo Park Forest, it's right above that. Hmm. There's a botanical garden there. El Mala Garden. Mikarheim Garden. This city is laid out in very a very interesting way. Is it really uh there are a lot of hills? Is it very hilly? I have, yes, I have, it's pretty hilly. Yeah. It's on a hill itself. It's on um, a hill, yeah. It's twenty four hundred feet up, which is decent. Hmm. Um what else I can't read the text in there, so Yeah. Um you can you can totally Google map cool. the biblical zoo or the Jerusalem zoo. You can just do that. Jerusalem Biblical Zoo. They only have animals from the Bible in it? No. <laughs> <I'm> kidding. <laughs> but their visitor that center was a joke. is Noah's Ark. Is it? Yeah. Okay, there's the zoo. Yeah, it is a long... It is... Okay. It's, it's not crazy far, but it's, yeah. it's a ride. Zoo. It is right... There it's a um, zoo. There's little, literally a biblical zoo train station, though, so I should be able to take some sort of public transit. They're going to teach me how before I start work. <laughs> Good. <laughs> you learn the alphabet first, learn Hebrew... Yep. Then you can get around town a little better. Yeah, I can ask people where <laughs> things are. Afo Zoo. <laughs> mm -hmm. Afo means where. Okay, so we were getting down in the right area. So you are more up here again. And Sue is down there. Awesome! Yeah, you have to go all the way across town. <laughs> I think that's cool. I like looking at maps. Yeah, I think maps cool. are just neat. You're like, yeah, that's cool. So today is your day off. Well, usually it is, but I still have to go to the old pond today, the Hebrew school, because we started late in the week. Because we didn't get here until like Monday midday. So we started school mm -hmm. Wednesday. So we usually have school gosh, what is it, Sunday through Thursday, I guess. But um, since we only had two days, or we're doing three days this week, we're having school today. Cool. Next yeah. week will be normal. Next week will be normal, so I'll be able to go back to bed right now. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> today, not so much. Today, yeah. drink your coffee or going. tea or yep. whatever, get going, get a move on. Well, yeah. I won't um, keep you anymore. That's okay. Um, Jack Pierce and the, they do speak, um, uh, a lot of people do speak English here, but not everybody. You come yeah. across a lot of people who um, don't speak any English at all. So it's, it's going to be very good for me to learn. Um, to me. Yeah. It's awesome. Immersion. Learn through immersion. That's great. Yeah. Which is terrifying, but fun. <laughs> <laughs> like most things worthwhile okay. doing. Terrifying, but fun. Terrifying but fun. Work through the fear. Use it to your advantage. That's right. <laughs> Make it happen. Make it so. All right. Well, you have to get on with your day. It's like yeah. getting toward what seven. It's almost seven thirty. Almost seven thirty. I have to leave here yeah. in an hour to walk to my class. That's so so I guess I'll get you out of my that. pajamas. You guys couldn't even tell I was wearing pajamas today. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, let me just get my hair out in front. You guys can't even tell. You look really cute today. It's all good. <laughs> you know, I, was, I was very impressed for the 5.30 in the morning start, especially oh, really? with going out with the, uh, going out with the kids. <laughs> yeah. Nice. That's what I'm going to call it for now. Going out with the kids. kids. Going, out, going out with the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, you guys want a view? Oh, yeah, they want a view. Right. Wait, we can see your kitchen. Do you have a roommate? Yeah. I do. But they're so, upstairs, so it's okay. No, she she was right on the other side of a door, so I told her I would just try today and see how it goes. Is it try to not drop my Don't drop your window. computer. Do you guys see that kinda? No, I saw cars in a street. Okay. So that's my street. 
We see cars and, then, and street and you can lift up. Oh, I see sun. Oh, look, there's another street. That's my street. That's interesting parking. Yeah. That's cool. That's so funny. That's exactly what my dad said when I sent him my first picture out yeah. the window. He's like, what is the parking structure like out there? That's weird. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. All right. People want to know how you uh, resolved your phone issues. Did you? Well, I have my iPhone on airplane mode, so I'm using it as a little computer and camera, and uh, I rented an Israeli phone. <laughs> nice. Good. So, yeah. All fixed. I, I do have air conditioning um, here, thank God. <laughs> it's very <laughs> hot. <laughs> Me from the 60-degree area of San Francisco, I'm all, like, the first day... It was yeah, get get used not to even it. Eighty degrees, and I was like, "I'm dying." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What am I doing here? Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. Get used to it. Yeah. That that, and then snow in the winter. It'll be good. Okay. Have all a, right. Have a good day. Go to school. Thank learn you. things. I will. Yeah. Get smart. <laughs> I will do my best. <laughs> Toda. Toda. <laughs> nice. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. I'm going to take off as well. Everybody, right. um, have a fabulous uh, weekend. This Week in Science will be back next week. Hopefully, we will uh, work out uh, whatever is keeping Justin from joining us. We'll try and make things work. Uh, and hopefully, things uh, work out so that Blair is a little, you know, has a little easier time of it in the morning. Yes. And <laughs> um, additionally, I want to let people know that there will be a Google Hangout on Tuesday at 3 p.m. Pacific time. Um, I'm going to be hanging out with Sean Lawrence Otto, who is the, uh, he's, he runs sciencedebate.org, and they put out a bunch of questions to the, the candidates, the presidential candidates and different congressional uh, uh, candidates, not candidates, but Congress people. Uh, based on science and policy, and the Democratic and Republican presidential candidates issued their responses this last week, uh, made them available, their deep essays, uh, and we will be discussing it, Sean and I, analyzing, debating, discussing what the uh, different candidates are actually saying in their writings. And mm -hmm. so uh, put that on your calendars. I hope that you can join. And then Science Chat, Justin TV, tomorrow... Uh, 12 noon Pacific time as normal and uh, this week in science next Thursday All right. yay yay Blair thank you very much for getting up and as much as it no was problem. painful and you look you look smiley and shiny and happy so <laughs> alright I was happy to do it I'll see you next week it was great to see you great to see yeah. you I'm glad you made it safely to Israel yes Yes. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Bye. Have a good weekend. Bye, Bye everybody. See y'all later. And ending broadcast.